Welcome back to Here's Next Door. Thank you all for joining us for another Station Rigs. This one's a very special episode because it's something we've never done before. We are going to take a look at a brush truck with a Wildland brush truck at South Metro. Let's go take a look. So we're going to be meeting up with Wes. He's one of the engineers here at the Wildland Fire Station, and he's going to show us around this amazing truck. Hey, Wes. Hi, how are you doing? Nah, good. good to see you. Good to see you as well. Now, beautiful way coming on this. This is out in the wilderness for me. I come from the East Coast where okay. it's a lot more suburban. Gorgeous place to have a fire station. Uh, this is a beautiful place. We love this uh, location for the house. I mean, we're in the woods. Uh, just this morning, we were watching the uh, four or five deer walk through the parking lot. So it's been fantastic. It's, it's really refreshing. And it feels like a resort. It does. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. We, we really enjoy it. So, okay. So we're here to do a station, uh, rigs on your mm -hmm. truck. And this is an amazing truck. It's something that we don't see on the East coast very often. Can you kind of explain to me what it is, what year it is and, and how it all works? Yeah, this is a brush engine 39. So it's a type three engine, which is a in between the type one, which is our normal engine and a type six, it's a smaller pickup brush truck type. Okay, those rig. are the ones that we're used to. The, yes. The typical Dodge or Ford trucks with a, a slide in. Exactly, okay. so this is in between. So it's a larger engine. It's a uh, 2014 uh, international chassis, uh, BME, Boise Mobile Equipment is okay. the one who uh, designed it for us. And they put it on this beautiful chassis. It's a four wheel drive and it's um, a fantastic rig for off-road and on-road. This is correctly. really big as far as you know, trucks are concerned, or even, you know, engines are concerned, it, that's because it needs to do off-road capabilities. Exactly. Correct? And if we have a large snowstorm, we can move some medical equipment over and some extrication equipment, and then we take this out in the winter okay. for four-wheel drive capabilities. Okay. All right. So, so can you walk me around? Maybe start in the uh, driver's seat. Tell me what you have and how things work. Yes. Come on over here. Okay. I'll show you. All right. This is the uh, driver's seat, my seat right here. Um, it's, it's an air ride. It's I an think. air ride. Yeah, yes, the, that makes uh, it nice and comfortable. So we build these and design them for uh, long trips because we deploy with these rigs, okay. which means our crew of four will go anywhere in the United States for wildland activity. Wow, I so, had no idea that you would be able to do that. I figured it was just in your local area. No, we primarily are local, but uh, with our wildland team, we could uh, send one of these out for any help that is needed around the country. Okay, um, okay. So we, we build them comfortable. The back seats are comfortable. We have radios, we have all the um, foam plug-ins and charging stations and everything else to get us out there. Right, because you could be deployed for an extended period of time. Up to 21 days. Wow, yeah. okay. So this is our home away from home. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay, so what do you got inside? So this is our you know normal uh, engine. We have the batteries, we turn the batteries on here. Okay. Um, Turns on the Niederman, which pulls the exhaust out of the station. Okay, that's equivalent to what we call a plume event. Yep. Yep. So okay. once it, it automatically comes on, radios turn on, all the lights turn on. Um, up front here, we could run the what we call an auxiliary tank or auxiliary pump. Okay. So when we do mobile attack, which means there's a fire, we're going after it, moving the rig. The auxiliary pump is not hooked into the drive shaft. It's a it's a standalone pump, so okay. we can drive, turn up the uh, pressure, and chase the fire. So unlike the engines that we're used to and that we've seen multiple times on the channel, where you have to put it in park, take put it in neutral, put it in and do pump drive, mm -hmm. you don't have to do this with this rig. Well, there's a second pump. Okay. We have a primary pump and the auxiliary pump. Okay. So the primary pump, we do that. We put it in drive. Uh, we actually do not dr put, put it in it drive in for this. We put it in neutral, and we could uh, actually pump without drive on this truck with the okay. PTO system but we do not do the mobile attack with the main pump okay okay the main pump would supply larger amounts of water to another rig um, or for drafting okay. uh, but the pri uh, the auxiliary pump we get on the, on the road these guys out here get on the ground start putting out fire they use the hose and we'll show you the different hoses that we use and go from there okay. uh, again lights we turn our lights on from in here, okay. our sirens and so horns typical from in emergency here. emergency lights that you have. Yep. Now I noticed you right off the bat, you have red and blue too. Where I yes. come from, red and blue are cops. 
<laughs> oh yeah, no, it's red and blue, and we have some amber on the back as well. Okay. Uh, we also have brow lights that are up on top and in the front in case it uh, we get in the when we get in the woods it gets really dark. Okay. And so those brow lights really open things up for us. Even driving our canyon here um, at night, it's really dark. So with all the animals around, yeah, putting those brow lights up and uh, the bumper lights really light things up for awesome. us. Awesome. So I noticed the large saddle tank that you have, you know, just climbing up into it. About how many gallons of fuel do you can you approximately load? seventy gallons of fuel? Okay. Yep. And uh, right here is where we fill it. Um, we have batteries right here, and then this is kind of like a little toolbox area for our. Um, the engine itself, with this side and the other side are kind of mirror of okay, each other. So you got a couple Tool of appliances. And, yes. Yeah. And we have an air kit. This truck has a compressor on it, a built-in compressor. So the compressor is used to um, hose off tools, hose off air filters, um, fill tires. Uh, use, a, use a grinding tool to sharpen tools, different things like that. Yeah. You don't see this a lot. And when we go out on deployments, a lot of times we get other departments, agencies running up with their air filters. Hey, can you blow ours out for right, us? Right, right. You know, so it's really nice. Um, that's the one thing that we don't think about when we think about fire. Mm -hmm. Typically, you know, you get a structure fire, you, your engine's away from the danger zone. You guys are actually going into that smoke. You're going into that environment to, to find the fire and put it out. Exactly. That can clog up an air filter pretty quickly. Yes, and during our morning checks, um, each person on the crew has a different assignment. Uh, the officer usually is over uh, with command or a morning briefing, getting all that information, and the, fire, the engineer will jump in and do his morning checks. Firefighters will go out and get lunches, waters, batteries, things we'll need for the day. Okay. Um, and one of the checks is checking fluids, blowing out the air filters, cabin filters, things like that. Right. Air conditioning on these rigs are awesome, but if the cabin filter is full, it's, it gets, it, it, get warm. It gets warm, right. Okay. And in the back, you said you carry two in the back? Yes, we carry two in the back as well. Okay. And they're captain's chairs. Like I said, we want to uh, comfort um, for the long distances that we ride. We do have air tanks in here. Um, typically, if we go out on deployment, we'll pull these things out because we, as a wildland firefighter, we will not go into a structure to put a, a fire out. Okay. Um, typically, once the fire's in the structure, um, most likely it's, it's too far gone for us to make any okay. type of advancement so on it. So you're doing more of a defensive, defensive. surround and drown kind yes. of? Yes. Yeah. So we pull these out and that way we have more room to store personal stuff on the way out. Okay. But in the winter, in district, we could use this rig for uh, structure fire if we have to because that one might not make it okay. in the snow, yeah. right? So that's why we do have those uh, tanks on there as well. Uh, different maps for uh, areas in our district, you know, each station has a area that they cover. So if I'm going to a different district, that map will tell me how many structures are within a certain area, what structures to protect, and that okay. type of thing, how much water is going to take. One of the challenges that we've had, um, even going from district to district, is communications. Mm -hmm. And you're going all over the nation. Mm -hmm. How do you communicate? Do you have radio system that kind of branches everybody? Or Yes. So we, we here in South Metro use the 800 system. Uh, when we travel outside, we use a Bindix King, Bindix King uh, VHF radio, and those are clonable radios once we get to the incident. So we go to the uh, radio tent, and we hook up our cables, and we clone to the local channels. So, so typically, every fire will set up their own radio channels per, per that fire, yep. and we get that cloned. Okay. So now we can talk to anybody on that fire. Okay. Um, every day, the channels change. As the incident gets bigger, they bring in more resources, things like that. That's one of the duties of the firefighters. Hey, take the radios over, get them cloned, or at least one of them. Yeah. They can bring it back to us, and we can clone the rest of them ourselves. That's pretty cool to have. Yeah. Yeah, it's something that we don't think about in you know just our normal local territory. Even going to our neighbors, when, you know, mm -hmm. we always have mutual aid. We don't really do that on the regular fire side. You know, okay. the, the capabilities that you have to do that. That's pretty slick. Yeah, it, it makes it really nice, and it's uh, and it, the radios are, are decent radios. Every year they get new radios. Um, this year we're getting new ones that the 800 and the VHF are hooked into one. Okay. So we'll see how that goes. All right. All right. So as we're working our way around, you got a small pump panel here. So this is our pump panel. As we were talking about, our main pump, it's a 500 GPM pump, so it puts out quite a bit of water. Okay. It's a 500-gallon tank, so we do carry a, a large amount of water with yeah. this rig. Comparable, okay. this is a 1,500-gallon per minute pump 
that holds 750 gallons of water. Okay. So, so you're this not too far behind that. Not too far behind it, no. But you're significantly more improved than the Dodge or the Ford trucks. Yes. They're, you know, maybe 7,500, maybe 200 max yes. on most of those trucks. Exactly. Yeah. So, and we also have a 20 gallon foam tank on there as well. So we can use the foam for those hard to get areas where we have a deep seated fire and we'll let that foam get inside and, and get the water inside as well. Okay. So, um, we have two, we could draft with this rig and we got a four inch draft and a two and a half inch draft. Okay. So the reason we need to draft is a lot of the wild land calls we go on, there's no water available. So we have to draft out of a pond, a lake, or a, a pumpkin, okay. what they call it. Yeah. So a pumpkin is just a big round orange uh, bathtub okay. that could be anywhere from five to 2,000 gallons. So we would call those almost like portable tanks. Yeah, portable so tanks. on this tender, we have a portable tank that drops down. The pumpkins, the reason we call them pumpkins because they're round and orange. It makes sense. Right, <laughs> so we can draft out of them as well. Okay. Um, and then uh, obviously our auxiliary pump we control from the inside. Okay. Now I notice on your hose reels and even your cross lays, they're much smaller than what I'm typical thinking of when I think of an engine. Yes. So when you're in the wildland arena, you want to try to use as little water as you can because you're in an area that doesn't have much water. So you want to be able to fight fire with as little water and make it last as long as you can. The smaller hoses, when you put water in them, they, they don't hold as much, right? right? Where if you use a two and a half off that one, you got a lot of water in that one foot section, which can go a lot farther with the smaller hoses. Okay, okay. And they're more portable and easier to maneuver with. Yeah, I mean, you get a hundred foot of hose behind you and that's full of water on an inch and a half or two inch hose. Exactly. That's a significant amount of weight. Exactly. And, you know, doing that and you know, spending all day fighting a, mm -hmm. a wildland car yep. can, be, can be tiring. Exactly, so when we put this truck into pump, and I, I throw my tank to pump, water goes out to all the outlets. Okay. So every outlet will have its own on-off valve. Okay. So I don't have to come over here and constantly open valves here where we can do it anywhere around the rig. You we'll start going into some of our compartments here. Now this is much shorter as far as compartments compared to a regular engine too. Yes, so we have to look for um, clearance as well. So if you're going through ditches and different uh, areas like that, you need that clearance. A shorter wheelbase is a lot better for those type of uh, areas in the woods. Okay. Right? So on the off-road uh, aspect, that, that approach and departure angles, yes. that's what you're really trying to get Exactly. From. Yeah. Okay. Those ones can't go very far. You know, you start hitting those dips, you're hitting the front and the back where these ones were able to do a lot better. You'll see some of them where this back end is cut up so it can even have a, a better departure angle right. to leave from. Right. Uh, this is one of our compartments. This holds a lot of our uh, special adapters and nozzles and, and just miscellaneous tools that we'll use. Mm -hmm. um, we, we tag them, so once we check them, we know they're good. Yeah. Right? We yeah. don't have to go through them every day. I do that a lot tagged. with my medical equipment, too. Right? You, know, exactly. you don't want to keep going over it, but as soon as it's tagged, you know it's gold. Exactly. And we've got you know, our, some of our typical hand tools. You've got a Rogue, a Pulaski, and a, a, a shovel or a... Uh, a uh, yeah, I'm, I'm throwing... It's a officer's tool, we call it. Okay. It, it opens up into a shovel and a pick. Okay. So. And I noticed you got the screens for the drafting. Is yes, the screens. Yep. This is a two and a half screen, so it has a, uh, a valve in here. So when you bring the water in, it will not come out the backside. So oh. the hose stays full of water. Right. Right. So once you take it off, you can like leave water in there. You don't have to constantly refill it right. to get it up. All right. Now, how concerned are you when you begin to draft? Because you're going to an unknown resource. Mm -hmm. you're, you're going to an area you may not have been before, especially mm -hmm. when you're doing that national response. How concerned are you about debris and fish and those kind of things getting up into your pump? We are really concerned and that's why we use the screens there. A lot of our discharges and valves have a screen inside of them as well to keep any other material from coming through them. Okay. So when we put those in the rivers or in the lakes, we typically tie them on to something to keep them above the, uh, oh, like a the bottom. Yeah. Okay. So it has to be uh, six to eight inches below the top because once you get to that venturi, you get like a little whirl. Yeah. You get air into the system it kills your draft. Right. So you want low enough, you don't lose the draft, but high enough, you're not pulling stuff off the ground. Especially engineering, right. yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, this compartment back here has some special tools for us. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, we do use um, chainsaws quite a bit. Yeah. So we cut down trees, brush, and different things like that. Okay. So most of our guys are certified as Sawyers. Okay. And there's three levels. Most of us are basic. Uh, we have a few that are the step up and that just determines what size tree you can take down and the difficulty of the tree as well. Right, right. Um, so we have these on all of our brush trucks and our type threes. Okay. Um, and it's a, they're pretty, um, 
standard on any brush truck and they're pretty beefy. So they, they cut real well. Right. But at the end of the day, you take them out, you take the chains off, you take everything off, you clean them up, you sharpen the chains so they're ready to go for the next day. Okay, and you right. guys are all trained to learn how to sharpen. I yes. don't have to bring it to a third vendor to get it sharpened or anything nope. like that. You guys can do yep. that in-house. We can do all that, we do that in-house. If you're out there cutting, you're cutting for two hours, your chain's gonna get dull. You take a break, you sharpen up your chain, and that way you can just keep on going without changing the chain. Okay. Okay. I also noticed, are those the chaps that These they These are have? the chaps, so <clears throat> if you're cutting, or if you're a swamper, the swamper is a guy that helps um, the person on the chain. So if I cut the branches, they grab the tree and pull them away. So e both people have to have um, chaps on. Okay. And they have to have helmets, earplugs, eye safety as well. Okay. Um, that way, because there's stuff going all over the place. Right. Plus, that person who's doing the swamping is also watching above. Okay. Um, unfortunately, every year we see fatalities from falling trees and mm -hmm. things like that. So right. we have those people back there watching for you as well. Okay. So, okay. And you got uh, your different fuels. Yeah, different fuels, uh, bar oil, fuel for the chain. Um, so if you're taking the chain out, you're going to take uh, a can, half of uh, oil and half of fuel. Okay. Okay. So this will go with this pounder. So the pounder axe will be used to pound wedges into the tree. Okay. So if you start cutting the tree and all of a sudden your chain gets bogged down, you can pound a wedge in there. Okay. You can get your chain out. Plus you can also direct the tree which way you want to go with a wedge if you need to. Right. I think that's the first time I've seen a pounder. Okay. Is that a specially made tool or did you guys come up with that? No, it's a specially made tool okay. that you know you use for that. You got smaller ones, bigger ones, but um, right. it's a specially made tool you can order. Okay. Yep. Um, and then you just, we got a pack in here in the back. Uh, which is our um, saw pack okay. and it just kind of show you some of the stuff and we take it out with whenever we go the swamper we usually grab this and it has uh, oh it's a backpack that's okay. a backpack you can put oil and gas in there as well yeah you have your um, wedges in here and you have um, different kits different tools Okay. Uh, files to sharpen your chain to take off the sides. Right. Uh, you also have a couple more cans here, and in the bottom, you have a little tub of all your spare parts for your saw. Oh, so yeah. So yeah. anything that might break or come apart, if you have to fix, you have all those okay. things. So everybody typically, once you take the class, the class is a full day on your saw. You take the saw apart, you, you uh, take all the pieces apart, you learn how to clean them, and you put them back together. Right. And then right. the next two to three days, you're out there cutting trees. Okay. So this, this goes with the fuel and the pounder. Right. So you guys are going out into those remote areas. Do you, are you EMTs? Are you paramedics? Do you have first aid equipment? Because this is a dangerous job. It I'm, is. You know. And we'll, we'll get to that. Okay. All right. Yes. <laughs> South Metro, all of our people have to be EMTs. Okay. And we have a lot of people that are medics with us as well. So our station here is a ALS station, but we don't have a paramedic or have a medic unit. Okay. But it's ALS because we have a paramedic on the engine. Nice. So okay. um, this is another special. Uh, tool that we use is called a Mark III. It's a portable pump and it's a, it's a high pressure pump. Okay. So this thing will pump miles if you ask it to. Wow. So um, what's so good about this and where they use them for is if we can't get this close enough to a water supply, we drop this down in the water supply, put a hose in the water and we can pump water to this rig. Okay. It's an inch and a half hose that goes on there. So it's going to take a few minutes to fill it. But if that's the only water supply you have, that's right. what you got. Right. Up on top, we'll show you we've got a kit. It's the pump kit. It's got drafting hose. Um, we use, whenever we put these down with fuel, we have little uh, basins, rubber basins. So we set them in so if fuel spills. We don't hurt the environment. Yeah. We try to protect the environment. They are also used uh, for structural protection. So we want to set up a sprinkler kit or sprinkler system around a structure. We use this with a pumpkin. Okay. We draft out the pumpkin and we supply all the sprinklers. Nice. We get it all set up, ready to go. As the fire comes, we start it up, we head out, let it protect it. And then when the fire goes by, we come back in and, and get, your, your, get equipment. your equipment or put out any hot spots, anything like that. Okay. So the Mark III pump are a fantastic piece of equipment. They can get finicky, yeah. Um, but it's a great piece of equipment and uh, 
all of our rigs, our Type Threes, have these on them. Okay. Yeah. It amazes me how much knowledge there is in wildland fire compared to structure fire and yes. stuff like that, or even brush fire. You know, yep. I'm typically going to a mulch fire mm -hmm. or maybe something around us. We don't have these kind of things, but the knowledge that you guys have taken uh, to get to that point to understand that I'm going to need this, I'm going to mm -hmm. need that. Uh, is really amazing to me. Yeah, and, and the classes we go through, one of the three biggest things that we deal with is topography, weather, and um, fuels. Okay. Okay, so the weather is huge, and any wind that comes up, it will dry out our fuels instantly, and the wind will push the fire in direction. Topography, with no wind, the fire runs up the hill. Right. Right, and then how thick are the fuels? You know, we got pretty thick fuels out here. So those are the three main components of wildland fire that we really study a lot on. Every morning in our morning briefing that the uh, captain gets when we come on a shift, they talk about weather. What's our weather for the day? What's the Haynes Index? What's all these different things can affect us as wildland so firefighters? So essentially weathermen. <laughs> yes, yeah. very much so, very much so. That's awesome. So. All right, I'll let you put this back and we'll right. continue around. Before we do that, do us a favor. Hit subscribe, hit notifications so we can keep bringing you more. Make a comment or two below. We want to hear what you guys do around the country. Obviously, I come from the East Coast. This is something new for us, uh, but we would like to hear from you too. So now we're making our way to the back side, right? Yeah, so the back of the rig. Nothing really exciting here, but we'll go over it. Right here is a direct fill. So we have another rig pumping to us. We can hook that and that goes directly into the tank. Okay. So I do not need my pump to work to get the water How in the tank. How often do you guys kind of daisy chain engines and rigs and stuff like that together? It, uh, it just depends um, the situation. We try not to leave hoses connected to rigs on the wildland arena in case we have to bug out real quick. Okay. So a lot of times you won't see a lot of hose out. We get the smaller hose out because it's lightweight and it's easier to put away. Okay. But if we have the two and a half inch hose laid out next to a structure, if we have to get out, we're cutting it loose and going. We're okay. leaving it behind because it's too hard to try to to right. load up right but it's nice when we need to fill we have the larger hose it goes quicker okay um so in the back here a couple compartments this is our draft hose that we were talking about yeah um i got three sections of four inch okay and then two sections of two and a half inch and even the two and a half inch are hard three inch. Are, are hard suction they are hard suction okay. yeah because you're just trying to pull that suction right if it's soft it will squeeze, it squeeze it yeah okay uh we have a couple pike poles in here if we need them a lot of times we'll use those to put out in the water to help hold the uh, uh hose up off the bottom of the okay uh the ground there yep. um this compartment you kind of mentioned it earlier um these two compartments we have these are wildland bags so they have helmets shirts um that we use if someone would rove in and doesn't have their own stuff they could use this okay if we go on deployment we pull this stuff off and leave it because everybody on the team has their own gear it, it gives us more space to uh put equipment right um, we've got a couple little posts here they'll go right in here so now we're doing jumping from structure to structure to putting out fires or moving you know, up or down. We could take our hose, wrap it up, and throw it on here. Okay. So we go to the next house, we just pull it off and move. Right. We don't have to put it away or anywhere. Okay. So you'll see this a lot when you, if you see a lot of videos of wildland fires, trucks going down the road, hoses are draped on the back. It's right. easy access to get it it's off almost and like the drying rack. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. So all of our rigs, our type threes have that as well. And space definitely is a premium for you space guys. Space is a premium. You know, yes. If you're gone for 21 days, you got to be almost self sufficient. Yes. So. Yeah. And especially with when COVID hit, when we go to a fire, we had to be self-sufficient for at least 72 hours. So food, water, clothing, everything we need, and we didn't expect anybody else to give us anything. Okay. Okay. Um, in this bottom compartment, we have our medical gear. We have a O2 bag, a AED, and then our medical bag yep. as well. Okay. So when I was fighting fire and doing all kinds of stuff, we had some pretty major events such as Katrina, Rita, mm -hmm. Gustav, that all came through. I was deployed down there. One of the most difficult things for us to do to get action down there and help them out was showing our certifications. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm a paramedic, I'm an EMT and that yep. kind of stuff. Do you guys pretty much pre-plan that then, or do you kind of bring your booklet with you? So we you don't, state state? we don't bring that, that we can act as EMPs and we get a letter signed from our physician advisor that okay. we could do that. Um, and we could do that with other departments. Now, as it comes as an ALS area, uh, we, we only allow our ALS to work on us, our okay. own people per the, um, uh, advisor because once you go to state to state you got the different rules. Yeah, the different rules so yeah we carry I'll sh I can show it to you in a little bit we carry a bag called our engine boss kit 
and it has all kinds of forms, papers, maps, everything we need to go through all that stuff. Okay. So um, that's a paper that we carry in there, signed off by our yeah. uh, physician it, advisor. That was one of the things that when I first went on my deployment down to Katrina, never even really thought about. It. I was like, oh, we're just going to help. You mm -hmm. know, I'm a paramedic. I, I'm coming to help. And they're like, whoop, stop, you're here. Yeah. I need to see. Yeah. And I get that. Uh, but sometimes that can be frustrating. Yeah, and then with the BLS stuff, it's you know mostly basic stuff that you know anybody could do who's right. certified that way. But when it comes to the ALS and giving medications and things like that, we've got letters that they can work on us. Yeah, and uh, okay. and we appreciate that definitely. That. So cooler for all the water that we take. Again, we'll take this stuff out. We'll throw extra water, and some of the bins up above, we got extra water and all that stuff in there already. Okay. So. Now we won't climb up, but we'll uh, get some B-roll of this. What okay. do you have up top? So up top, um, on this right side, we have a two and a half inch supply hose. So again, if we're in district in a, on a really uh, snowy day, and we have to take this to a structure fire, we got a supply hose that we could use to a hydrant. We also got a pre-connect right here. It's an inch and a half or inch three quarter pre-connect that we can hook on here like it's on our other engine. So okay. we could use those hoses for a structure fire or a car fire, anything like yeah. that what we need. Okay. Um, do you have any like coffin bins up top? We do. Storage? We've got two, we got coffin bins on both sides. So there's four doors. Okay. So typically each person riding on this rig will get one coffin bin to supply all their gear. Okay. Sleeping gear, extra clothing, extra little things you want to take with you. Right. Um, we take coffee kits with us because a lot of times we are nighttime Right. We do night ops and right. we're up all night long, so coffee helps. So yeah. we have a coffee kit. I'm a Diet Coke guy. <laughs> oh, right? Yeah, so we do that. Um, this side is just a spare bin that has a lot of different uh, equipment in there. Okay. Extra hose, one inch, inch and a half. It's got extra cases of water, extra Gatorade, MREs. Um, Self-sufficient, we have to have food from somewhere. Yeah. And the MREs we have up there, they're probably 20 years old, like everywhere has an MRE yeah, they and they're still the good, <laughs> right? So yes, yeah, so we'll use MREs and you can get extra MREs from camp if you find a camp or anything like that okay. that you can get the food from. And then on the very front, we have another bin that has all of our fuels in it. We have gasoline, diesel, drip torch fuel. Um, and then we have a center compartment up there that has our pump kit I was talking about. Anything to go with our Mark III pump. Gotcha. Uh, different tools, uh, different equipment to work on, and okay. then uh, your suction hose gotcha. as well. Okay. Um, this last compartment here is ladders. Yep. Um, and then we have a jack up there if we need a jack or a fence puller. Right. So if we're going into an area, we have to get through the field, there's a fence. We could pull posts, cut the fence, go through, but we also have equipment to Put it back together. Fix it okay. and put it back together right. if we need to. Right. Um, I got a tool back here, and this is my tool because it's my size, right? <laughs> so I needed to put this back here. So, but we have uh, many more tools on the side. And that's another unique thing is that you're having a brush truck that has ladder on it. Right. You know, you, I don't see that very often either. Again, we go back to the pickup trucks that we were talking about. We don't usually have ladders. We've got rakes, we've got all the other stuff. But exactly. No yeah, and like I said, these we could use this on a structure fire around district right. in the snow. We have that equipment to allow us to do that as well. So let's come over here before we get on the other side. We've okay. got some new equipment that we're putting on the rig. Whoa, and look at the size of that rope. What would you use this for? So this is what we're going to use to pull ourselves out or someone else out of trouble. Uh, if we get into an area where the truck gets stuck, uh, sandy areas, things like that, we can use ropes with another rig to pull us out or we pull someone else out. Okay. Well, with the rig this big, you need big ropes. So these ropes right here, this one's 115,000 pounds wow. of uh, strength on it, right? Okay. It's strength. Yeah, even the, um, the D-ring. Yeah, the, the clevis and the pins are huge yeah. and they'll fit on the back of the truck and on the front as we need to. Okay. And just, you have another tactical recovery rope equipment here yeah. as well. So this will all go on the new new uh, rig up on top. And what would those be used for? Yeah, this is something you can, if you can't get the uh, the hook around a hole in there, you could slide this down in there okay. maybe, and you could put so it. it's a soft It's a soft, it's a soft ring, okay. yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, Man, so that's... that will go up on top. It may take three of us to get it up there, but it will it will <laughs> yeah. be work great to get us or anybody else out of a sticky situation. Well, if you're out there and you're a little bored, you want to do a workout, just carry this around. For a exactly, bit. <laughs> right? Do a little jump rope with yeah. it. <laughs> All right, we'll go on the passenger side over here. 
And this first compartment has what we call progressive hose packs. Okay. So this pack has 100 feet of one inch, 100 feet of an inch and a half, uh, a Y, a nozzle, and some adapters. Okay. So the idea about these packs is we're pulling up on a fire, it's going into the woods or into the grass. We hook this on to an outlet on the front of the truck and we take water with us with the hose reel and we put fire out, but that is on our, pack, on our back. As we're walking, it's laying out. All four of us would carry one of those packs. So at 100 feet, the next person would hook in. We'd start, we'd uh, call for water. Yeah. We use that to put fire out next to us. The next person hooks up into that, walks out another 100 feet, taking the one inch uh, hose with them with water. Right. So we're putting fire out as we go. Okay. So these, we've got six of these packs on this rig, four here, two up top. Okay. We have two packs that are red and they're called, what we call our trunk line. So it's an inch and a half, 200 feet. So if the fire's 300 feet in the woods, instead of wasting these packs to get to the fire, we hook the trunk to it. Then we hook one of these and start water and then we start walking into the woods. Man, so, man. so you're obviously not using uh, what we consider bunker gear when you're doing these kind of fires. Cause that, that weight alone is, you know, 70 pounds with an air pack, that yep. kind of stuff. But you're carrying a significant amount of weight also, right? We are, and uh, when we get around, I'll show you some other equipment that we use, our personal equipment, and okay. how much that weighs, and this goes on top of it. Right. So right. Uh, we have extra hose in here as well, inch and a half hose. We also have that up on top. Okay. Um, we carry lots and lots of hose. So these packs, uh, a lot of people refer, in our area refer to these as a front range pack because the other departments in the area use them. Okay. West Metro, Golden, Fairmont, all these front range departments use the same type of pack. Right. Good consistency across the board. Yeah. And it looks like you have the old fashioned Indian packs. We do. Yeah, yeah the pump packs. Yeah. So you fill those with water, you walk into the fire, and you use the pump to put the fire out. Yeah. Right. By the time you get to the fire, you usually half the water you had. Yeah. You know, those old, everybody knows the old <laughs> they, pump pack. Yeah. And we also have a mop up kit. Okay. In that mop up kit, we have what they call pencil hose, or it's three quarter inch garden hose. Okay. Okay. But it's the same material as this. Okay. So you take that out, you're, in, in mop up, you're using less water. You don't want to use that much water, just enough to get the ground wet, dig it up, and that sort of thing. We have different types of valves, nozzles, and everything else in that kit. So we can lay a line out, put the valves on, and we can spread out four or five different hoses in different directions so everybody can work on an area to, right. for mop up. So the, the major concept of wildland fire is obviously putting the water out, or putting the fire out with water, but it's also getting rid of the fuel as yes. far as the source of the fire. Is so a correct? lot of things, it's with wildland fire, water goes to a certain point, right? You can only use so much water. But when you have trees on fire all around you, water's not gonna put that out. So you need to work on defensible spacing. You need to take the fuel away. There's multiple ways to do it. You use dozers to take down trees. You cut line if the fire's on the ground. If you cut line, the fire gets to the line, you're good. You set back fires. So if a fire's coming to me, I create a line by putting a, uh, with the tools or water, and then I light the grass or the fuel on fire. And as that large fire moves towards you, the indraft of air on that fire will suck the back burn that you have into it, and it takes away all that fuel. Okay. So um, you're, sure, you're fighting fire with, with fire. fire. Yes. So <laughs> it seems a little backwards, but it, it is. Really but when you, when you get into an area like our neighborhoods, yeah. it's hard to get people to understand that putting some fire down will help you right. in certain areas, okay. right? So, uh, but you go out in the woods, and there'll be areas where they'll burn two or three thousand acres to save. 50 to 100,000 acres. Okay. So, what is one thing that you would tell a resident that they can do to help prevent some of these kind of things? Do you, should they clean their yard pretty regularly and stuff yeah. like that? Yeah, that's one of the biggest things is you, there are contractors out there or agencies, fire agencies out there that will come help you describe what you need to do. And what is taking some trees down, getting rid of all the leaf litter, the needles on the ground, your gutters need to be cleaned out, anything under decks that could cause fire. Um, our big fire we had a year and a half ago, the Marshall Fire, destroyed over a thousand homes. Yeah, I most of that. that, most of those homes caught on fire from the embers because the wind was 100 miles an hour. Right. So the embers from are blowing underneath homes, are blowing into areas where there's fuel to catch. Okay. Right. So in our areas here, we talk to people about getting rid of those extra fuels, the leaves, the needles, um, old wood, okay. fireplace. Everybody 
has fireplaces here and they get wood. Yeah. So that's something that we have to do. We'll go, if we could go in there and possibly save that structure, we get rid of a lot of that stuff. We throw the wood away, we get it out of the way, we get rid of the, the needles and things like that. Okay. People move in the woods because they want to live in the trees, yeah. right? So some people aren't going to, they don't want to make <laughs> that change, but right. uh, a lot of people around here are doing that and they're making those changes and it's helping quite a bit. Okay. So. All right, this is the plume event, or you guys haven't called this something different. It's called the Niederman. That's the Niederman. brand name. Okay. Yep. yep. So yep. start the engine up, and all the exhaust goes outside. Yeah. And for those that don't understand what that is, it basically takes all that exhaust that 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 has the carcinogens and stuff, and it actually pumps it and gets it out of here to make their home that much safer. Yep. This compartment is our tool compartment. These are all of our hand tools that we would use. Um, um, a cloud, it's kind of like a rake and a hoe on one side. You got a modified, um, the combination tool. Okay. Right? This is what I call the officer's tool, combination yep. tool. Uh, another Pulaski and then shovels. Okay. Right? Uh, we do have a you even got a Halligan, Halligan yeah. Denver tool yeah. in here as well. All right, like we said on the other side with the pump, here's another pre-connect on this side with the valve. Okay. You know, we, again, the water goes to every spot and we open up the valves. Yeah. Uh, this one is a couple extra packs. Yeah. Um, we pull those off when we travel okay. uh, for more room to put our stuff in. Yeah. Um, Again, space is a commodity Space here. is a commodity, exactly. <laughs> and then right here, we got a couple drip torches. Okay. This is what we use to start backfires. Okay. All right. Um, all wildland firefighters in their uh, gear pack also carry a few Zs. You know, that's another way to start a backfire, but it's an also way for yourself, your protection. If we're getting overrun and we need to clear some fuel out, we can light the fusee real quick, light the grass around us to burn away from us okay. uh, to help protect us as well. Nice. So, but we carry a couple cans. We got drip torch fuel up above. Okay. Uh, that drip torch fuel can, is consistent with, or has diesel and gas. And depends how, how you want it to burn, you put more gas, but typically it's uh, two to one okay. uh, diesel versus gas. Gotcha. All right, and this is just the other side you're getting in. So you got, you know, Crews getting in either yep. side. The other side, same same type of thing. Um, we do have a radio kit on here as well. Okay. This is the uh, VHF radios we were talking about, the yeah. Bendit's Kings that are, are programmable. Okay. So right now they're programmed to our district. So if we get a fire in our district, we have all, their, uh, all of our communications within our agency and nearby agencies. When we go out and about, we clone them to that area. And then when we come back from a deployment, this rig goes to fleet. So fleet checks it, makes sure everything's good to go, ready to go. Okay. The radios also go to uh, dispatch. They get reprogrammed back to our uh, area. And then our engine boss kit, okay. you know, all the paperwork that's used and everything gets resupplied as well. Again, this is our officer seat, um, air ride as well. Nice. And then he sits up, he's got a, a computer up there, a laptop or in district use. Okay. Um, we get a call, it comes in on the screen, it shows us where we're going, it maps us to the location, and then any additional information that comes through okay. um, as we're getting there. Okay. So. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah we do something very similar. We call it an MDC, mobile data computer. Same thing. Or whatever. Yeah, same thing. Gives you all the information yep. and, and any updates. I'm just surprised how big the truck yes, is. Yes, the, the truck sit, sits yeah. up there quite yeah. a bit, right? My personal Heroes Next Door truck, you know, it's a F-150. I put an eight inch lift on it. It's got 37 <laughs> inch tires. Right. This thing dwarfs it. it, it yeah. it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. In the front here, we have some pre-connects that we sit up front, and this is mostly for our uh, mobile attack. Okay. Um, we have shorter hose, typically about 20, 20 25 feet. Right. So when I'm driving, what I like to have my firefighter when they're running the hose is to be at like a 45 degree angle for me. So I could see down over the truck. If you look up there, it's tough. If you're too close, you can't yeah, see anybody. Yeah. So if they're out about 20 feet, 45 degree angle, I could see them, they could see behind me, and I could also see behind me in the mirror as well. Okay. So when you first said mobile attack, I thought you actually had, you do have sprinklers down here that are actually protecting the truck too, but you're deploying men on top of yes. that. Yes. So th these sprinklers are okay. Okay. Um, they'll, they'll do good in an emergency. If, if fire's coming and we can't get out real quick, we can throw those down and help stop it. Right. But for a mobile attack, we want the direct line on the fire okay. or the edge where these are more of a angled out cover probably about a 15 foot okay. swath. And just so, kind of cool it off as yes. you make your way through. And I can't control how much water comes out of these. Okay. So we want to save water, we'll use the hose lines right, right, right. here. 
Yeah, and these tip look like our typical trash lines is yep. what we call them. Yep, yep yeah. exactly. But they're they're 20 feet because you don't want the hose hanging from you as you're dry because all the plants and sticks and everything catch the hose and that you can't pull it. So right. these guys are walking along with the hose on their shoulder and it's above the ground and we're moving. And I'm moving as fast as they're moving. Right, and you don't want to run over the hose. Nope. So that, nope. that goes to back to your training that you guys do. How mm -hmm. often do you guys go out and actually practice those kind of things? Because if I'm a rookie, I come on here, I'm right. pulling that hose, I gotta make sure I'm doing the right things. How exactly, so we do crew trainings within the station quite a bit, but the Wildland team itself has monthly trainings and we hit a subject every month and the whole team gets together within three days or each shift and does the training. Uh, every year we have new firefighters come on that wanna be on the team. So they have a task book to start as a wildland firefighter. So they'll come down, they'll either rove into the station for 48 hours or they'll come from another station and we'll set up training so they can go over some things. Um, and we do that quite often. We have a, a new group of 13 that just joined the wildland team this year. Okay. So we get a call, hey, do you guys wanna go do this training with us? Yeah, let's go do it. So they get new training, we get refreshed training right. and it's, it's great to get everybody involved that way. Okay. You do a lot of training, but mm -hmm. you, what kind of gear do you use? I'm used to having bunker pants and stuff like that. Can you show us a little bit of what kind of gear you actually carry? Yeah, exactly. Let's go ahead and walk around this side of the rig here. And I've got my gear kind of laid out over here on the floor. Okay. So the pant, like you said, bunker pants and coats and everything, 50 pounds plus with everything else that goes on them. Right. These are uh, Nomex pants that we use. They so are Nomex. They're Nomex okay. and they're lightweight, okay. right? So this is the something that the team has. Um, everyone on the department is trained in basic wildland firefighting. So if you're not on the team, you get the yellows. And this is a typical shirt that you see all around yeah, the country, yeah. right? I, I watched a couple TV shows. And exactly. All so the team members will have yellow shirts and then the non-team members will have yellow pants. Okay. So, okay. but this is another shirt that we put on. We now, typically- Is that also Nomex or is that- This is also Nomex, yep. Okay. And then we wear long sleeves typically okay. to help with that as well. So you can imagine out in the middle of a hundred degree day with fire blowing at you, and the sun, it gets kind of it, yeah. quite warm, you right? You heat yourself up pretty quickly. Then you have to have the certified wildland boots, okay. uh, uh, hiking boots. So um, my typical boot would just melt and yes. not do well. Yep, <laughs> yep. So these are uh, the certified, have to have nine inch okay. high boots. There's all different types out there that people like. Hot shots like a different type. I like something that's easy and comfortable. Right. You know, right. those leather boots that uh, the hot shots wear, they're in them every day. Yeah. They form to their feet and they're great. For me, if I'm not in that much, they don't feel that comfortable. And these are fantastic. Right, right. Um, and here's our helmets. Uh, looks like just a regular construction helmet. Yeah. Um, it's got a wide brim all the way around, help for any falling debris. That type Unlike of the, the uh, Philly helmets or the New York helmets, it, you get that weight. And you yes. know, even after a two hour structure fire, your neck is kind of sore, stuff like that. Yeah. Having a nice lightweight helmet uh, is gonna be very important. Exactly. But I see you do have a Nomex hood in it. We do have a hood in there. Some people, okay. you'll see these helmets come with a uh, sheath that goes around the neck. Okay. Um, some people don't like, I don't like those. So I have my protection. I wear this over the top. If we get into an area, I'll put it on and have this and yeah. it does the same thing for me. Okay. All right. Uh, for us in our district, we have three different colors, yellow, black, and um, red. Okay. So the yellows are for your, your basic wildland firefighters, anyone out there on any of the rigs right. or even guys on the team that need to take more classes. Okay. So they're a tier two right. that we, for, for us. Uh, tier one, our guys have taken more classes, uh, more advanced classes, they have black helmets. Okay. So as a commander, I can look out in the field, I say, okay, we got a bunch of yellow helmets over there, but I got a bunch of over here with black helmets with more experience. If we need to do something, he can lean in. Right, that helps with the incident command of kind of shifting things around. And then the red helmets are engine bosses. Okay. So they've actually got a lot more training, uh, more command uh, type training and personnel training and things like that. So you can look out there and say, hey, there's my engine boss. He's gonna make a lot of decisions because he had all these extra trainings. Okay. So what we have right here on the bottom is a fire shelter. And we pull it open and pull it out. And this is what we use if we're getting in a blowover situation. Okay. If the fire's coming, we have nowhere to go and we have to protect ourselves. This is what we get into. So the, what we need to do is kind of dig to mineral earth, get all the burnable fuel away from you. Okay, so the grass, the, the grass, leaves, all that yep. kind of stuff. Okay. Um, you throw all your stuff away. You want to keep gloves, water, and radio. 
Um, you do not dump water on yourself if you're getting hot because then you'll just get Steam. stinged. Right. Yeah. So okay. water is to drink when you're inside. You have a radio to talk to uh, command and then your gloves to help hold this down. Okay. So when you pull this open, it's a, it, it's a um, aluminum shelter with different layers inside that helps protect from the heat. All it does is kind of deflect the heat. It's gonna get hot, it's gonna be miserable, yeah. but it will protect you from that heat. Now, unfortunately, if the fire is rolling on you and there's too much fuel, they can burn at certain temperatures. Okay. But it's uh, the last resort right. that you wanna. Now, I've watched you know a lot of TV and did like Deadliest Catch, and they practice getting in their suits if the ship is going down. Do you guys then practice that? We do you do. have a standard on how quickly you should be able to get into that? Uh, yes, yeah, so you wanna try to be in it within 30 seconds, if that, okay. if not sooner than that. So right. the whole idea is we put it in our pack and we have green ones, plastic ones, right? So we use those as our trainers. Okay. So we put them on our, we're doing our work. Someone says, deploy, deploy. Deploy, you throw our equipment away, you grab them out, you pull them, you flop in them, you jump in and you get secure. And then someone goes around and shakes them to make sure you got them secure. Okay. If I were to want to do this, what kind of people do you guys look for? How do you do the recruitment? And what kind of uh, personality do I need to have to do wildland fire? Because it's totally different from anything I've seen before. Yeah, so our department's a little different than you'll see with a lot of the hotshot crews, the hand crews and things like that. Uh, we look for firefighters who are go-getters, who are physically shape, in shape, and want to get out and, and help the community and help their brothers and sisters online. And with our department, you come in as a firefighter, and you learn to be a firefighter, and then you go to the special teams, and the wildland is one of our special teams. So that's another area that after you've been on for a year or so that you can apply to be a wildland firefighter. Okay. That's different than you would see in a hot shot or um, hand crews where you apply to be on those different crews. Okay. Okay. So it's it's kind of a harder question, I think, to answer for sure. our area, okay. but it's an area that, you know, we have a lot of guys who've been hot shots, who've been on those hand crews and have done a lot of that type of work and they bring that to us as uh, uh, right. city firefighters, if you want to call it. Okay. Um, but we do, as you can see, have a lot of that wildland urban interface area that, and the crews are at these stations are at these stations because they want to be wildland firefighters as well. Right, so it's just, right. a, it's another little add on to the typical firefighter. I got one last question. Sure. I know I've been talking to Eric, he's your PIO. He uh -huh. does a fantastic job on your YouTube channel. If you guys haven't seen his YouTube channel, definitely go over and see uh, South Metro Fire Rescue and check them out. Um, I wanna know, how do I apply? Is there a website? Is there? Yeah, yeah. go to uh, South Metro fire uh, firerescue.org and okay. you can go on the web page and there's different areas that you can go into the web page and look for apply now okay uh, we have different uh, up to two academies a year right now and that's for the near future who knows how you know yeah. people are retiring and leave for different reasons and there's seems like there's always openings so okay. you go into our web page and, and look it up it's it's right there for you so okay. And that goes for you guys too, that you're watching. If you're ever interested in getting into the fire service, coming to join a fantastic department like South Metro, hit them up, start the application and do it now. Well, Wes, thank you so much for walking us around. Thank you. We really appreciate you guys, you know, you putting your life on the line for, you know, residents and everything. It's, it's something that's admirable. It's, I don't see it a whole lot on the East Coast. Uh, so coming out here and, and learning what I learned today has been invaluable. So thank you so much for taking your time out of your day and showing thank us. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Yeah. Once again, this was Heroes Next Door. This is the Station Rigs with Station 39 doing the Wildland Fire brush truck. And uh, we appreciate everything they do. If you guys like what you see, do us a favor, hit that subscribe, hit that notification, smash those like buttons, and make some comments below. We want to see what's going on across the country. Uh, we want to hear from you guys. Thank you all for watching, and we'll see you again next week. My glasses.